Hi, it's the Voices team here to do a breakdown of what is in Governor Northam's budget for fiscal year 21 and 22. This is Emily Griffey here with the Voices team, and I have my colleagues here to say hello and introduce themselves as folks come on the line. Good morning, afternoon. <laughs> this is Ashley Arrington, and I lead our health and mental health policy work here. Hi, this is Allison Gilbreth, and I do our foster care policy work. Hi, this is Chloe Edwards, and I am our outreach coordinator on the campaign for a trauma-informed Virginia. So thank you for joining us this afternoon to learn more about what's in the budget. Uh, if you have not joined us online, there is a link on our webpage under our events where you can find the join meeting link. There's also something posted to our Facebook where you can find that link as well. Uh, we will record the webinar if you want to listen to it later or share with others. Um, so the recording has started now and we also have a chat function if you are online um, to write in your questions as anything pops up and we will answer those at the end. So thank you for thank you for joining us today, and um, we are going to get started. Um, so Chloe, do you want to kick us off with some detail on what's coming up and what you can expect to participate in as an advocate? Okay. Hi again. This is Chloe Edwards on our campaign for a trauma informed Virginia. Um, on our website, we have. A, blog post that features town halls that could possibly be in your district, just go to vakids.org and you should see it on the Voices blog. Um, now is the opportunity where we're gearing up to really mobilize advocates um, to get excited about advocacy. And these are opportunities that you can make your voice heard at the local level to inform your state representative. We also have the budget hearing, um, hearings coming up. NOVA will be an extremely powerful region, and our NOVA consultant, Mary Beth, will be excited to work with you in preparing you for that. And just keep in mind that the General Assembly also begins January 8th, and we have a list of our advocacy days on the following slide. So um, our campaign for Trauma Informed Virginia Advocacy Day is January 21st. Uh, we hope to have trauma-informed community network members and leaders represented, but also invite other organizations to get involved, so please share information. For our Home Visiting Advocacy Day, that's January 22nd, and Families Forward is taking the lead on that. Uh, we also have Children's Home Society that's taking the lead on Foster Care Advocacy Day, if you would like to join. Mental Health Advocacy Day, um, we are hosting with other partner organizations so on February 5th. And then February 17th, we have a play date at the Capitol in the form of a family and children's rally. So all of this information is on our website, on the Voices blog, or under our events page. We also have several blogs that you can read, but to stay informed, we provide advocacy toolkits for you. And so we have a lot of tools, including an advocacy one-on-one -on -one training, as well as a talking point prep sessions that you can schedule with myself or my colleague, Mary Beth. We invite you to promote our advocacy days um, with your partners or following or whoever follows you. Um, and then we also invite you to sign on to our unified campaign for a trauma informed Virginia advocacy um, policy agenda. Thanks, Chloe. We have so much going on, lots of ways for people to connect and be an advocate this General Assembly session and willing to provide you with any help along the way um, to navigate all of these opportunities. We'd lo love to hear people raise their voices up during the General Assembly session. Um, there is a lot of good news to celebrate in the budget. Uh, so as we'll get into that, you'll see lots of opportunities, things that you may want to send a message of thanks to the legislators and send a message of why these investments are so important. There are a few other things that we're lifting up through um, the, this presentation that will highlight things that are missing from the budget and that will need continued advocacy. Um, so that is our, our hope. So what our overall takeaway is that this budget has a lot of good things. There's significant investments in mental health, in foster care, in early childhood. And you know, some, an excellent start for um, for our work and our advocacy. We didn't get all that we want, 
still we're going to keep asking and working with the legislature. The process from this point, of course, is the governor proposes the budget and the legislators can make amendments and changes to it. Uh, the Senate produces its own version and the House produces its own version and then they negotiate through any differences. Um, so we will continue to provide updates on what is happening in the budget um, for our, our program areas uh, throughout the legislative session. And uh, to start it off, I'm going to turn it over to Ashley to talk about our health and wellness areas. We were really excited in, in the proposed uh, budget that Northam put out. Um, uh, a significant investment in, um, in home visiting. Uh, it, it's an additional $13 million uh, to expand uh, home visiting in Virginia, and that's, it was a priority for the. It is a priority for the North administration, and um, we're really excited about the $13 million. In this health bucket, uh, there's also additional funding to extend. Um, Medicaid coverage, so for famous moms, uh, for low-income pregnant mo women, um, which currently it is um, yes, 60 days. 60 days postpartum, and it will extend that by 10 months so that a mom will have it 12 months postpartum. Uh, and in addition, another really important uh, um, proposal he added was uh, eliminating the 40-quarter work requirement for legal permanent residents. Uh, we are one of the only states that still has that work requirement, um, so that is an important change to make. Um, uh, sorry, uh, yes, work requirement. And then it also is we're going to study um, what it would look like to have a Medicaid benefit for doula care in Virginia as well. Yep. So Governor Northam's first budget announcement focused on this area. Uh, improving maternal health and reducing racial disparities. So there's a lot of good news to celebrate mm -hmm. in this proposal. Uh, the other good news to celebrate in this proposal in this area of health and wellness is that um, with Medicaid expansion, more parents are being covered and more children are getting health insurance. And so we want to continue to ensure that um, all of those pieces move forward as well of continuing parents and children's health coverage overall. Mm -hmm. and, any issues with that, we will let you know. Yeah, and then you want to go into mental health. Absolutely. So this is a huge investment that the North administration uh, put forth in its budget. It's an additional $235.3 million, general fund dollars, uh, to address the critical needs in the, the DBHDS system. Uh, now that's for, for kids and for adults, so keep in mind there. So we'll go into the next slide, please. We've talked, we talked about this last year as well, um, and it was part of our, our campaign for Common Informed Virginia, um, and it was part of our Voices Policy uh, agenda. So as you remember, VMAP is a pediatric-driven training consultation or referral model uh, that really bridges uh, the divide between behavioral health and, um, and how we interact uh, with pediatric and pediatric care. So, uh, last year, there was an initial investment of $1.23 million uh, to build a statewide infrastructure for VMAP. And this year, uh, we couldn't be more excited that Governor Northam put the, uh, invested the full amount of $4.2 million to complete you know, all aspects of, of VMAP and uh, to expand it statewide. And Steph, Virginia. Uh, we have been talking about South Virginia for a number of years, and it is Virginia's um, effort to transform our public uh, behavioral health system. Uh, as you can see on your left, uh, this is uh, how services, uh, all nine of the South Virginia services, are uh, when they're supposed to be implemented and the current status of them, and the funding allocation. Um, to your right in the box is what Governor Northam included in his proposed budget, um, and he proposes in uh, the first year, fiscal year 21, um, close to $20 million, and then the second year, $30 million uh, to build out, um, to partially build out the following mental health services, uh, outpatient uh, mental health services for kids and for adults, veteran services, peer support services for, for kids and for families, um, and mobile crisis, a mobile crisis team. 
Um, as you can, as you, many of you probably know, uh, in the code, it says that all services must be implemented by 2021, and that wasn't changed in the governor's budget. Um, and it, and it, it, we've been told that it's a decision that the legislature has to make. Um, but CSB, the public mental health system, they are mandated to provide all of these services and have them up and running by 2021. So that is an action that must be taken. Um, finally, this is new, um, $5 million of non-general fund dollars from the DBHDS Trust Fund to develop and maintain a statewide crisis hotline. Um, and this is for mobile crisis teams. Mm -hmm. And uh, behavioral health workforce, as you all know, is, um, is a large problem um, across the nation and in Virginia. And uh, over uh, the last few years, we've been talking about the need for changes uh, to increase the number of providers we have in our system and to recruit and, retra and uh, retain them as well. Uh, so like last year, we're building off last year's progress with the increasing the Medicaid reimbursement rate or psychiatric services. Um, we're building off that and it's an increase of 14.7% um, and that's the equivalent of 110% of the Medicare rate. And that's uh, a little over $2 million each year. Uh, behavioral health, uh, workforce study and training. So they included a, mi a million dollars to conduct a behavioral health workforce study. Um, I think that's critical because we understand where some of the gaps um, are currently, uh, but we don't have a full understanding and scope of, of the entire um, issues with recruiting and retaining uh, staff in our public and our private mental health system. Uh, so this is a critical component to that. And it also includes money uh, to train providers in the services um, that are part of our behavioral health uh, redesign um, proposal, which includes um, MST, FFT. Multisystemic Thank family you. therapy and functional oh, family the therapy. Acronym. Oh, yeah. the acronym. So we've probably already <laughs> out, out acronym you, even yes. before we get to CCCA. Yes. So, so I'm not going to go through all of this, but the Commonwealth Center for Children and Adolescents is our only in-state psychiatric um, inpatient hospital in Virginia. As you all have heard about, this is a really big problem. There are major um, census issues at our state uh, hospitals for adults and for kids, and adults usually take up most of the space when we're talking about this problem. Uh, so the, the, in the caboose bill um, this year- Which is the budget that um, gets introduced for the current fiscal year. Yeah. That's Fun, fun word for it is the caboose. Yes. Uh, it establishes a work group to examine and identify alternatives, uh, alternative treatments and sites for, for kids and adolescents who would be placed into the Commonwealth Center for Children and Adolescents. Um, and this is building off of a study this year, a year-long study that um, DBHCS was in charge of. Uh, and to accompany the caboose bill, uh, in his budget for 20, for the, the upcoming budget, uh, there is an additional, he submitted an additional 6.3 million and 8.4 million uh, for the provision of, of acute inpatient behavioral health services. And um, we're still learning more about this um, because the language, allow, the language allows agencies to contract with private providers or, uh, or to support additional beds if there aren't any, um, if, there, if, if private providers are not, are not able to um, uh, meet the need. So we don't know, we're still learning from the agencies and the administration what exactly this would look like and we'll be providing more information along the way. And finally, um, you know, I, I have two slides about the CCCA because it did take up most of the mental health space and conversations this year uh, and um, uh, they, there is only one of them. And so this year they again asked for additional uh, funding to support really needed clinical staff at the Commonwealth Center to keep, to make sure, um, you know, that they, they are fully staffed and are able to meet all the, need, the needs of all the kids that they serve at, at CCCA. And those workforce issues are kind of a common theme in each of our areas this year, right? So there's so one final slide on mental health and just to highlight what was not included and that's fully funding all nine uh, step Virginia services. Uh, and, and also they did not, the Governor Northam's budget did not include changes to the code 
um, that would change the implementation date of, of several new services. Uh, there is, is, and we support this, it's, a, it's in our policy priorities, funding to support a student loan repayment program for behavioral health providers, and then as we discussed in our last webinar, um, an effort around early childhood mental health, and uh, that is a study um, with DOE and DBHCS to look at the feasibility of implementation of statewide um, early childhood mental health consultation services. Great. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a great cross-cutting issue from the early childhood mm -hmm. space and the mental health space. So if folks have questions about anything that Ashley has, something that you felt might be on here that is missing, please use the chat box and we'll, we'll come back to those as you're thinking of them. If you um, uh, are not online or using the chat, you can email me, emily at bakids.org. And as Ashley mentioned, there are early are finding out more details and providing more information, we'll be continuing to provide talking points and blog posts that will give a better picture of some of these details as well. But overall, very good news in mental health, a robust mm -hmm. agenda that covers a lot of different areas. Um, next, I'm going to switch to our trauma-informed schools area, which is where we touch on education. Uh, as you know, VOICES does not really focus on the K-12 through system as a, a total, but ensuring that kids enter school ready to learn and that they are healthy and um, able to succeed and, and learn in school. So one of the key areas of that is making schools more trauma-informed. Uh, last year, we lifted up additional counselors and support staff, and the governor has continued to make good on the promise to reduce the staffing ratio of counselors to students to 1 to 250. Uh, he's included 99 million over the two years to get to that ratio of school counselors. So that um, is really good news from the education side of things, um, and hopefully there will be a lot of support there. Again, in the theme of um, what that we got a lot of what we wanted, but we didn't get everything that we wanted. In the education space, the proposal was about half of what the Board of Education requested to fully fund the standards of quality. Um, so there will likely be other education asks coming to the General Assembly, in particular things that we've worked on before, the other support positions beyond counselors, that is the social workers, the psychologists, the school nurses, um, were not included in the governor's proposal. Um, and, so, and we still know that there are significant deficits and shortages there as well. So we'll be looking to provide more information on those areas too. Um, uh, so moving on from schools to early childhood education. Um, this is an area too that is a significant focus of Governor Northam and the First Lady. I will direct you back to some of the healthy moms, healthy babies talking points that Ashley already covered that also really for us also falls under the early childhood education um, components as well, which included the better access for health coverage and home visiting, as well as the educational elements that I'm going to go through that are really about closing that opportunity gap for low-income three- and four-year-olds to attend a high-quality preschool. Um, so there, this was also an area of significant funding, over $95 million over the two years for early childhood, which is the largest investment ever in that space. There are a number of actions here, and so I think what's important to keep in mind in this early childhood proposal is that they are intended to work together and to build off of each other. There, the early childhood components all help to create um, better tools for local governments and providers to be able to provide access to early childhood education. So there's a number of moving parts here because it's intended to be a toolbox or suite of options for localities to pull from. Um, the, the proposals include increasing the Virginia per, pre, BPI per pupil amount. We know it is still far below the cost that it actually would cost to provide those quality services. This would be re increasing it about 10% or up to about $7,000 in the second year. Providing incentives 
uh, per child to private providers to promote mixed delivery options, so in public and private settings, providing additional funding for um, increasing class size and student to teacher ratio, so to have some flexibility in how the formula is used, um, flexibility in what counts as an in-kind contribution for a local match and an increase to up to 50% of that local match can be in-kind, um, a set aside of funds for localities that have waiting lists and are able to enroll kids uh, even after the early enrollment date, and then a couple processes and changes that add some additional flexibility to VPI and the mixed delivery grants so that uh, VPI and mixed delivery grant dollars can be used to serve threes as well as fours. Um, so there's a couple of changes there to provide that access to threes and fours. Um, so what we have here in terms of the overall impact is one of the largest budget actions ever for early childhood, for families, it closes those opportunity gaps, helps offset the cost of high quality early childhood for their kids, particularly economically disadvantaged and kids of color. For providers, it builds in incentives to help build the system in the private sector with that $2,500 per kid and mixed delivery incentives. And then for localities or local school divisions, they also have higher per pupil contribution from the from the state, as well as more tools and incentives to build services that meet their local needs. Um, so these pieces work together, and we're excited to see an overall package that will um, be able to help build a more robust early childhood system in Virginia. Um, moving on to, so again, if you have any questions about the early childhood elements, please put them in the chat. Or anything that you thought was missing that we would like us to include, um, please do have something there. There will be more blogs, more opportunities for talking points coming in the early childhood space too. Um, that, so if you aren't thinking of anything, we're moving on to family economic security. Um, and this is our area that we can help ensure that low-income families are provided with the support to reduce economic hardship and stress on, on families. Um, included in the budget for our TANF dollars, which are federal temporary assistance for needy families that provide cash assistance benefits, is an increase in 5% of the cash benefit, um, some flexibility on the family cap, what's the family cap provision that limits the number of people in the family that qualifies for benefits and um, expansion of the summer feeding program. Well, these are all good steps in the right direction. We actually were hoping to see a higher um, increase in the cash assistance benefits and raising of the standard of need for eligibility more than 5% um, because we are far below what the um, but inflation would actually provide us for TANF and have some additional funding there. So we will be supporting the budget amendments bills that um, move us forward to a higher benefit and eligibility um, amount in for TANF. Uh, some things to consider uh, in terms of family economic security are the overall picture of the budget. Uh, some of what Northam proposed to have additional revenue are uh, what are considered some regressive tasks, taxes rather than progressive taxes. These are they're regressive because everybody has to pay for them, including low-income individuals. Uh, so the taxes that he has proposed are on gas tax and cigarette tax. Um, so ho folks are also looking at how do we offset the, the impact of that or look into tax options that are less regressive. Some of those options could be refundable or early income, um, sorry, earned income tax credits or other tax credits, paid family leave and minimum wage proposals. We anticipate there being a lot of energy from some of the more progressive groups on these issues this year and voices will monitor and uh, be able to provide updates as needed if other advocates are needed in that space. Um, if you have any questions on those family economic security proposals, please again chat or email me, Emily at VA Kids, and we'll get those to the at the end. I'm going to switch over to Allison talking about our foster care. 
Thanks. So again, moving with all the things um, that Voices has been working on, we're all pretty excited and pleased with what was introduced in the governor's budget. Um, I think this the investments that are in the proposal are reflective of a couple of year journey. Um, definitely a turning point with the JLARC report that many of you are aware of, and then um, Delegate Emily Brewer and Senator Monty Mason, Mason starting the Foster Care Caucus has been very helpful. Um, and so there's been about 100 million in new investments for foster care in the 2020 proposed budget. So I'm just gonna highlight um, some of them here. So, and the first bucket is to stabilize the workforce. There's 18 million over the two years. Um, there's, if you look, if you're very detail oriented, you might see this in two different places because one is for overall for all local Department of Social Services staff, but then there's a separate, separate one that's just for child welfare workforce, and that would increase their salaries 20%. The current base is 30,828. And if the proposed budget were enacted, it would increase it to $36,993. Um, we see this to be very important. We heard from lots of folks all year that one of the most um, pressing issues in the foster care system um, is the turnover rate in Virginia. And the next one, I am absolutely thrilled. I think I cried a little bit at home <laughs> when I saw this in the budget. I didn't, I definitely cried. Um, with the Kinship Care Financial Assistance, uh, it's 16 million proposed um, over the next two years uh, in the budget. It's the first time ever that we would have funding for uh, relatives who are raising children outside of the foster care system. For, so for folks, I know there's folks from all different sectors listening in, and this is for children who um, are diverted, so they would have come into the attention of uh, CPS, Child Protective Services, but they found a, a relative who was willing to take them. Right now, the only thing that those relatives would be getting is child-only TANF, which is currently $163. The thing we don't know is we don't know the details yet on how much per child the payment would be, and we don't know if it would be only going forward if families would be getting this or if it would be retroactive. So those are things we're going to be paying close attention to. And the next one is uh, something, honestly, we didn't expect to see in the budget. It's $66 million to fund local Department of Social Services to begin hiring staff and creating prevention services departments um, this is a lot in response to the Family First Prevention Services Act. If you remember, when this first came out, we were really excited, but we also noted that there was no money to actually hire staff or do this work. So this is in response to some of that. The, for those of you who are, who are involved in the three-branch um, model process that's doing the implementation of Family First, you might know that we don't have a prevention plan created yet, and so we are trying to figure out how this money would be utilized um, over the next two years to prepare us to fully implement Family First. And then the next bucket of money that was invested in um, the governor's proposed budget is $4 million for startup fees to create those, not create, but um, invest in evidence-based services throughout the state. Um, this is, again, to help with implementation of Family First. There's also $5 million in the budget to hire position, basically create an evaluation team for those evidence-based services. And some of those examples are functional family therapy, healthy families, multi-systematic therapy. And so this really ties into the behavioral health redesign. It's just a lot of the same programs. So we're gonna be seeing some investments in evidence-based programs that are bucketed in different areas, but it's very much the same program. Um, the budget, Proposal also includes funding for two new staff people in the state to oversee those contracts. And then the next big bucket uh, is $33 million to provide evidence-based and trauma-informed services. So this is the actual service part. The first part is to fund the um, development of those services, and this for, is for the actual services. And so just to, if you're not sure what at imminent risk of entering foster care is, I put that definition in there for you. Um, this is, again, 
what we're trying to do is prevent children from entering foster care in the first place. And we've talked about this. If you've been in this field for a long time, you know that this is what we've been talking about for a very long time. And the process of doing that really is building out services in all of our communities. And um, this is, this, a lot of this comes out of that evidence-based work group that was in part of the three-branch model. So this is the governor's investment in those next steps. And a lot of this comes from the Federal Family First Prevention Services, as a response to the Federal right. Family First Prevention Services Act legislation, where we can actually, this includes a 50-50 federal match for what the state puts in as local dollars. So half of these dollars that you see are state and half are federal in these areas so yeah. for Family First. And I can say today that we're actually the first state to have some state dollars invested in the services part of the model. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and then what's not included in the foster care bucket that we will be working on is we heard from youth the challenges that they continue to face when uh, trying to obtain their driver's license while in foster care. And so we are going, Senator Favola has already agreed to put in a budget amendment again this year for 250000 that those dollars, if approved, would be used to pay for the car insurance for youth. That's the most significant financial barrier that youth are experiencing. Um, we know only about 4% of youth in foster care actually get their driver's license while in care. The other thing that was not included in the budget is we also heard from youth that many of them while in care never saw their guardian at litem. Um, oftentimes meeting them for the first time while they were in court about to say what is in their best interest to a judge. Um, and we know that there are a lot of issues around compensation. Um, Virginia Poverty Law Center is going to be taking the lead on this issue and um, filing the budget amendment, so I don't have those numbers just yet. So the impact, the budget, I don't want to, I mean, while there were some things that we don't know and things we need to get more clarity about. This is a significant step forward and shows that this administration truly wants to make an investment in foster care. I will say the thing that it also lacks is the dollars to train the workforce. Um, we're talking about shifting a organization that has been primarily focused on um, reacting and shifting it to prevention. And so that does take uh, training our workforce and how we train our workforce. So I'm disappointed to not just see any money there. Um, so I think that's going to be an, make an impact on how we're able to roll this out. The impact on families is it finally puts the money behind the concept of preventing children from entering foster care, which, again, something the uh, local departments of social services workers talk about all the time. The money doesn't match up with the system's values, and so this is pairing that model to that. On providers, it incentivizes more providers to um, scale up their evidence-based services because there will be funding available to do so. And then on the local Department of Social Services side, it shows as a state we're trying to take steps forward to stabilize the workforce. Um, and it also helps us to build out a continuum of services to offer for families. We know that one size doesn't fit all. Some children are best served with relatives outside of the foster care system. Some need formal kinship care. Some need formal foster care. We have to have the same, we need to have services at every level funded and we're able to provide the services to those families. Thanks, Allison. I think that was the last of the foster care issues. Um, if you have questions for Allison, please put them in the chat or email me. Um, and I will um, pass them along as well. Allison will have more updates coming through the General Assembly and more things to watch. So stay tuned for more activities there. Um, the final bucket is around um, trauma-informed communities, and we wanted to point out two items that were included on our unified policy agenda for the trauma campaign that were not included in the budget. 
Uh, these are very much companion efforts to the things that, uh, that Allison has talked about with the foster care and prevention, that we also need communities to be strong in addition to families to help support all of the professionals and uh, folks working with kids in, in this space. So these are two opportunities to do that. One is to provide additional funding for the trauma-informed community networks through the Family and Children's Trust Fund. Children's Trust across the country play a big role in, provide, in prevention activities. And in Virginia, our trust fund FACT has shifted its focus to supporting trauma-informed community networks in a re more robust way. And we've seen some great successes in how um, folks are collaborating at the local level in these areas. Um, so we hope that the legislature, the final budget, will include some additional funding for the for FACT. They are in the midst of getting ready to release an RFP that could fund six communities, but there are more than 20 around the state, and we'd love to have um, enough access for all of those communities to have strong backbone support for their organizations. The other thing that was not included in the budget was ACEs interface training. Um, the Department of Behavioral Health has funded a national model called ACEs Interface and a number of community partners to become trained in this national model about how to talk about ACEs, how to identify ACEs, um, how to respond, and so it is an excellent opportunity for more folks in each community to get a better understanding of ACEs and trauma-informed care um, and build and continue this model so we will be also looking for a budget amendment that will add funding for the Department of Behavioral Health um, to continue the ACEs interface training. Um, so we will need advocates to lift up these issues as they are, um, as we move forward through the General Assembly process. We have had a number of questions that I'm going to let my colleagues um, answer as they, as they can. One question for Allison on is there anything in the budget pertaining to fostering futures? Uh, so the fostering futures is already in the budget. Um, that's actually how we started the program almost three or four years ago now. It'll be four years in 2020. So we're good there. What we're going to be focused on is actually codifying it, so putting it in code. And usually kind of sometimes works the other way where we sometimes get it in code before we get the dollars. but. Um, so we're, we're safe on the money, we just are going to be focused on getting it codified. Great. So that will be outside of the budget, a bill. We'll yeah. look for more information to give you on bill and bill patrons. Uh, this question about was it related to the kinship um, dollars, is it a separate fund like adoption subsidy? And that might not be, might not have all the details to answer. We, I probably can't answer that the way, uh, with, as, with as much clarity as I would like to. It's going to come from TANF, which is the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, and it's most likely going to be transferred into DSS, and so we will have more details on what that is going to look like as we move further into the legislative session. Um, and they'll, DSS is probably going to work to create some criteria around um, who quali would qualify and how long they stay eligible and those sorts of things. So, and Allison will probably be collaborating with the members of the foster care network to get some information about how the yes. proposals are shaped. So that's a great opportunity there. Um, clarification, I believe, on the evidence-based services in the Family First bucket. Um, I think w this is another area probably where we still need more information and more details. There, are, what we have in terms of the uh, high-level details is that there is one bucket that is intended to scale up. So those services that are needed to help become uh, a fidelity to the evidence-based models, and then another bucket that is used to provide the services. And I'll have to go look and see whether the scale-up also includes a 50-50 match, or was mm -hmm. it just the services themselves? Okay, I'm, sure. I'm looking at a bunch of pieces of papers in front of me, and it, it looks, looks like, like it's 50-50, like like yes. yeah. It does look like, yes, they are counting that. Um, so we'll, we'll clarify that more. And then another back to the beginning and the um, mental health work, yeah, some so, clarification mm -hmm. around Step Virginia Scale Up. Yes, yeah, so I mentioned that part of the proposal included funding for uh, peer support services. Uh, and I mentioned families, but it also is inclusive of uh, family support partners. 
that help uh, families, you know, uh, navigate the behavioral health system. And uh, the reimbursement, we know that part of the issue is the reimbursement, uh, current reimbursement is pretty low. Um, but, you know, I think it's important to point out because the family support uh, specialists or family support partners um, are really in, in, a really important part of, of behavioral health system in many states. Um, and part of it's really important part of children of children's mental health system, uh, but we don't talk about it that frequently. And we talk about peer support as part of SEP Virginia. Um, so I think as advocates, it's important that we lift lift up that that part of that particular service, um, especially as we move towards um, funding for it. Great. Okay. Yeah. Something something new to get more educated around on the peer support. Um, another issue that folks are asking about to learn more about is the ACES interface training. And we know that this may be new to people. They've been piloting it in communities through the community services boards. Uh, so you may not have, have it quite yet in your community. Um, but what, what we have heard is some very positive feedback from the folks who have been trainers as well as trained in the ACES interface model and that it is a national evidence-based practice. Um, so we are hoping that the additional funding can continue to support it in more communities. It has this, a train-the-trainer model where you, several people from the community become official master trainers and then go out and they can train a school audience or a mental health clinic, clinical audience or a com passionate community group or anybody that might want to know more about um, in particular, what are the impacts of ACEs and how to provide more trauma-informed approaches. Um, so that is hopefully answers your question about the ACEs interface, um, ACEs interface proposal. Um, so it's an opportunity for communities to, to, have, uh, to connect to each other, similar to build off the, the infrastructure of the trauma-informed community network. Um, another question about um, the GAL. So the question is um, asking if it's going to be a bill for the GAL payment rate, but what it, it's going to be a budget amendment. Um, budget amendments have to be filed the first week of the legislative session, and the way budget amendments work are a member puts in a request. Um, we usually try to get someone on the House and the Senate side. And the members can the members of House Appropriations and Senate Finance will hear the budget amendments and consider them. And if they want to, want isn't the right word. <laughs> <laughs> if, if other legislators are in support of the right them. of that, then they will try to figure it out in the um, budget. Then then they have crossover, and then they figure out a deal for the have one budget instead of two different. Um, budgets that they're working with. So that's, it will not be a bill, it will just be a budget amendment. So yes, Virginia Poverty Law Center. Yes, Virginia Poverty Law Center is leading that Valerie LaRue there. And their attorneys who we do not, uh, do not come to voices for legal advice. No. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Or custody. <laughs> uh, and anyone else have any other questions? We had such a great smattering of questions from all the, diff the different areas. So really appreciate mm -hmm. everyone listening in and hearing about how these different how these different proposals impact kids across the lifespan and, and in many different areas uh, to, to have healthy kids, uh, prepared school kids, succeeding in school kids, supportive mm -hmm. families, better economic success for families. So if there are things here that you want to advocate for this General Assembly session, um, be sure to schedule a talking point appointment with Chloe or Mary Beth if you're in Northern Virginia. There's a link on our website that you can um, that you can um, have put in some information about what you would like to prepare for your talking points. You can use their comments at a budget hearing on January 2nd or track a local town hall. We're trying to add a more robust list of town halls in communities to our website, but also encourage you to follow your legislators on their Facebook or, or other social media feeds to find out about more events. And then we have a number of days that you can come and join us at the General Assembly or join one of our other partners like Families Forward, Children's Home Society, 
NAMI, um, Mental Health America, um, and our other early childhood partners. Uh, so we are excited about all of those opportunities too. Our pictures and, and information are on these last pages. Um, and so we have had 75 people on our webinar. I think we were up to like 84 okay. at one point. So I just want you to know as policy analysts here, that just makes our heart just <laughs> burst because <laughs> uh, it's really exciting to see people that interested in kids' issues, but even more so in the budget, which isn't the, sometimes the most okay. exciting thing when we're waving a flag. <laughs> but it's really important for, Absolutely. for kids to have access to all of these opportunities as well. So if you want to follow up with any particular area, our questions, our, our pictures, and our emails are right here on the last page. We're pretty simple. Our first names at VA Kids is the best way to find it. Um, and had just a few other comments. Kimberly saying, if anyone wants to come to Prince William, they have some ACE interfaces training happening in 2020. Um, so connect with Kimberly Fleming um, and probably their trauma-informed community network or their, their CSB there, I think, is, is probably helping to lead that. I think I've heard. Um, and also, somebody asked questions about there are other things that have been in our radar around suspension, expulsion, seclusion, and restraint. If we want to talk about that briefly, and the, uh, we see our work around the early childhood mental health consultation model as a way to address suspensions and expulsions in the early childhood space. Uh, some of our partners, like the um, Legal Aid Justice Center, are doing have a bill around disorderly conduct. Mm -hmm. Uh, related to suspension and expulsion, um, so I mean, you know that there, there will be some work on that, but nothing specifically that is uh, on our policy agenda this year. Besides early childhood. Besides the um, mental health consultation model. Mm -hmm. um, so that hopefully you guys heard a little bit of everything, something to be excited about in the budget. There's certainly a lot of things that we're excited about. Uh, we anticipate that there will be, you know, things will be well received from a Democratic governor now handing this budget over to a democratically controlled House and Senate, but nothing is guaranteed. In particular, there's a lot of additional pieces in the education arena in particular that folks were hoping, hoping were included in the budget, and um, we anticipate there will be some continued negotiation throughout the legislative process. Since these budget items don't get a bill hearing like other legislation, that's why it's so important to come to the budget hearings or to say something in a town hall or attend an advocacy day, and that's why we lift these opportunities up to you um, who are here to connect on the budget. Hopefully everyone has signed up for our email list and uh, get our Friday emails during session because there will be more information coming. And now everybody can um, kick back and relax and enjoy the holidays for a, a week or two and then get revived and relaxed for the General Assembly's <laughs> madness to start in January. Um, thank you everyone for calling in and uh, appreciate your being able to share this time with us. Thanks. Thank you.